I'm going to talk to you about health and social care. And I'm going to talk to you, I'm going to ask you a question. Um, is it possible that you and your communities can create health and social care services that are relevant to the place that you live? And if you can, what does that tell us about the future of public services generally? And before I do that, I'm going to tell you a story. And this is a story about um, a woman called Alison, who lives in a poor area, um, not unspecific, she lives in a, a poor area. And like all poor areas, it suffers from a number of challenges, um, alcohol, poverty, drugs combined. But in Alison's case, she's also had a challenging childhood, which again is not uncommon, caused by the stresses of the community, parents. At the age of 20, she started drinking. She started drinking to get on with her relationships. She started drinking because it made her feel good and because it was masking some of the mental health challenges that had developed from an early age. And her drinking got worse and it meant that she couldn't hold down proper relationships and the relationships that she had weren't great. And the services in that community could either deal with the mental health or the alcohol, but not both, or the education, but not all three. By the time Alison was 40, she had um, liver disease, stage four, which is pretty serious. She had osteoporosis because of the poor diet, the drinking, and her mental health problems had not subsided. In fact, they'd got worse. In her 40s, she had difficulty getting out of bed, and she had heart problems, and she was visiting the hospital five times a month, at least. Now, Alison is typical, or not untypical, of the challenges that the health and social care system faces. She has multiple problems, but is presented by services that are fragmented, that aren't in her place, but are in places. So the idea of place-based community health and social care is relevant to the Alisons of this world, but it's also relevant to each of you. So let me tell you why it matters to the NHS and the social care system. At this moment in time, the NHS, faces, the NHS and social care system faces three challenges. The first is increasing demand. So let me give you an example of that. Between the years um, 2003 and 2015, the numbers of, 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 of visits to the major A&E hospitals, just the major ones, the big ones, had increased by 18%. So you're going from a number um, of 12 million to 15 million visits. That's just in the major ones. The second problem is that we have poverty. But we don't just have poverty everywhere, we have the difference between rich and poor. So in Barking and Dagenham, a woman has an active life expectancy of 53 before things start falling apart. In Richmond-upon-Thames, it's over 70. The cost to the NHS of poor people turning up at a and &E because they don't have services in their community bespoke to their needs, according to York University's Centre of Health Economics is 4.8 billion pounds a year. We know that increasing demand has not been met by increasing funds for local authorities. In fact, local governments have had a 24% cut since we started the age of austerity. Now, in Alison's case, she was lucky. She happened to uh, be referred to a service that actually Turning Point designed with the community that provided a one-stop shop. Someone who took Alison and actually managed her alcohol and her mental health and worked with her to design, to work with her so that she got all the services that she needed in one place. Alison, I'm glad to say, stopped drinking. She's got a job and she's looking forward to a positive future, but she's lucky. That project was a pilot project. It no longer exists. I'm pretty certain that if Alison 
had the issues that she's got now, she'd probably be dead. So we have Alison, we have an NHS and social care system under challenge, and we have you, we have the public. And so what do the public think? Kent University did some work on this, and it was interesting, actually. It works, it turns out, that the public want to spend more money on the NHS and social care system. In fact, 53% of conservative voters want to spend more money on the NHS. And well over 60% of Labour voters want to spend money on the NHS and social care system. But when the public are asked, they also say, you know what, we don't think the, pub the government spends the money well. We think it wastes money. So here you have a contradiction. We have the fact that you want to spend more, but you think it's going to be wasted. Why is that? What's the answer? Well, I think the answer is in engagement. The engagement of you in the design and delivery of services in health and social care. And why do I think that? Well, I think that because of the way the NHS started. The apocryphal story of how we got the NHS the most famous brand in the world, pretty much. We love it, don't we? The NHS was started in a village in North Wales, Tredega, and it was started by people, the working poor, less educated and certainly poorer than any one of you are ever likely to meet or will ever meet, and certainly less educated. And they started the NHS because they couldn't afford doctors, or hospitals and they decided that they would design a service that they all put money into, they all paid into a pot and that service would provide them with health and social care when they need it free at the point of contact. And in, fa in fact Nye Bevan when he gave his speech on the creation of the NHS said I'm going to tradegarize the health and social care system in this country and that's exactly what he did and the reason why we love the NHS is because we created it, we remember. It's in us. So, it's 2019, and me and my organization have done a lot of work in lots of places about the gap between public expectation, resource need. What do we do? What have we learned? What can that story about the NHS tell us? Well, it can tell us this. Communities can be engaged in the design and delivery of health and social care services, but there are rules, and there are four rules of community engagement, and they're very clear and very obvious, and the first is this, you have to listen. Now, that seems really easy, but if I tell you that I'm listening, I don't know why I'm pointing at you, you just look cool, but that's why I'm point listening. That's nothing, it's meaningless. You need evidence that you've been heard. That's the first rule. The second is that there has to be a transfer of power. And that means that as a result of this engagement, you have to be able to do something that you couldn't do before the engagement. That's the second rule. The third is that at worst, at worst, the outcome of this engagement has to be co-produced between me and you. I'm pointing at you because I cannot avoid the color of that top. It has to be co-produced, at worst. At best, you have to decide the outcome. The people of Tradiga decided the outcome. It wasn't decided for them. They recognized it as theirs. And the final rule, is that you have to be able to describe that service in one sentence to your mother, brother, lover, wife, community. You all know what A&E means. That's why you go there. It says what it does on the tin. So we can do it. The rules are there. So why don't we? We don't because, and this is an ask really, if you're a leader and you're watching or listening this, listening to this, this is what you should do. You should take those rules and you should be curious 
about your organization? What does it know? What does it know about the community who pays for it? You should be curious about your community. What does it really need as opposed to what does it get? You should be curious about yourself because if you recognize the problem that I'm talking about, you're part of it. And only by asking yourself questions about your role in this challenge can you create the means by which you can engage fully with the community. The results of this are not just a future for the health and social care system, but a future for public services. A future in which we have positive value transfer. Like Alison, we should all be able to go to one place and get as much as possible. That's positive value transfer as opposed to going to several places, using our time and our money and getting a bit from each service. That's negative value transfer. You should be able to tell your story once because that service understands who you are, where you are, in place. There should be no wrong door. We should have better outcomes and more efficient use of resources. I think, for Alison's sake, we have the execution movers. We know how to do this. If we want, and if you want, a future for your public services, you need to ensure that we do. Thank you very much. <laughs>